Yeah, yeah, check this out. This is Fresh Kid out of the China, man. Get the two live boot. Yo, yo, what's up, y'all? It's me, DMC. What's up, y'all? This the boy, Master B. Yo, check this out. Chuck the public enemy. Yo, what's up? This is DJ Yellow from the Warriors. Yo, what's up? This is Jay Z. 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 Yo, what's up
and that meant learning how to, you know, tag and, you know, try and break dancing in front of the mirror, you know, pop locking was big, beatboxing like Dougie Fresh, this was, you know, we're talking about a long time ago, and, uh, and of course, the DJing and rapping, you know, I had a little realistic, I had two turntables, you know, just with, whatever the accessories were, we sort of got them to get, you know, the tools, not the accessories, actually, that's an important point, you know. <laughs> I wasn't really into like, you know, necessarily dressing a certain way, or I just wanted the tools. I wanted to know how to do all these these elements before anyone had even declared there were, you know, the four elements of hip hop or whatever, the five elements. <laughs> and uh, um, but that's where it started. Do you remember the first track in hip hop you heard in your life? Yeah, well, it was, uh, you know, yeah, it was Sugar Hill Gang. Um, and then the one, that, the first one I memorized was the message. Yeah. And my brother's doing fast, and my mother's TV, kids watch too much, just not healthy. All my people on the day shot in Dallas at night, can't even see the game or the sugar rate fight. The bill collectors that ring my phone, scared my wife, and I'm not home. Got a bump education, double this year, face, you can take you know, all that. Like the Daniel, you want to be raps. <laughs> yeah. Like Dr. Dre is a real Dr. Dre. It was before that. It was before <laughs> that, man. <laughs> no, I mean, this was like before MTV. This is when MTV yeah, was yeah, scared yeah. to put black people on TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Michael Jackson had to change that shit. Mm. You know, I mean, you know, it's, that's how you gotta remember. It was like everything was fought for mm -hmm. and everything was a struggle. MTV was scared to put black people on. Yeah. They thought they were gonna lose fans. I heard about that, yes. Yeah, and it wasn't until Michael Jackson was just unstoppable, you know, and now we dominate. As we were dominating before, since everyone was scared. Mm. You live in New York too? You live in New York too? I lived in New York for yeah. Shit, yeah. 17 years? <coughs> 90, 92 until 2004. Yeah. And I lived, uh, I lived in Harlem, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. I think I, I enjoyed the Bronx the most. Mm -hmm. We moved up there in like 96. Pretty much we were just following this one engineer, this friend of ours, who ran a place called TME Studios, the Midnight Eye. They're still rolling. Fred Wunz is a graph artist and a producer mm -hmm. and a DJ. You got the Bronx indicator over there. <laughs> yeah, and Dan so. Dan O'Dee. <laughs> well, he like. Yeah. So Fred was from the Bronx, and then when he, f he found a place in the building where his dad was, and. He, he was the one with the studio. He was the one with the Yamaha U2R. Mm -hmm. So we all followed him to be near near uh, the studio so we could make records easily. And that's why I made Welcome to the After Future. That's why I made the first mm. Festicons records. Um, yeah. You made a mix in your, in your style into spoken word and uh, hip hop. And uh, Who was your inspiration? It was... Uh, Rob Brown or or Jesper Teron or Les Poets? No, honestly, it just sort of came. The reason I was, if, if I had a poetic inspiration, uh, it was probably Ishmael Reed. When I was young, it was Langston Hughes. When I meaning like 11, so all this stuff popped up at the same time between 10 and 11. This yeah. interest in punk rock, this interest in hip hop, and poetry is all sparked at the same time. But I didn't really. I was rapping, so then in high school I was a drummer in a punk band, mm -hmm. very bad one, bassist. Then I ended up sort of rapping on in this funk band we had, where we were trying to be funkadelic and not Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> I was like 80, I don't know, 86 to 88. And then when I got to um, college, we started this hip hop band, and uh, I already knew then that I wanted to do. I was already doing sort of left-wing shit, like, like, uh, I used to, you know, this was 1988, I used to take White Rabbit, you know, Jefferson Airplane, and then freestyle mm -hmm. over that, mm -hmm. and just sort of rap over that, so I, I was already interested in doing stuff that was off time, and back then, you know, aside from, like, Divine Styler, things were pretty straight ahead, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so there wasn't much room, especially in Boston, which is pretty conservative at that time, in terms of what hip-hop was and what it wasn't. Mm -hmm. The only place where I could really do sort of experimental lyrics was, at the, was in the spoken word scene. And that's how I ended up finding that scene. I, didn't, I never wanted to be a spoken word artist. I like being a poet on page. And I like being an MC. And for me, it's just a personal thing to keep those two separate. But I fell into the spoken word scene because um, 
that was the only venue where there was sort of open ears at that point in Boston. And then that led me to New York. Um, and of course, yeah, like I listened to Ishrat Brown and uh, and, uh, and the last poet, Salah Jalal's, you know, I mean, the Hustler Convention, Jalal, you know, Rest in Power, who just passed last week. Okay. You know, Hustler's Convention, I used to love that, you know. Um, I didn't necessarily want to do something like it, but it was, you know, I, I obsessed over that record. Um, uh, I, you know, but I was always kind of looking for out stuff. I remember I have all these cassettes, like, just crazy cats, I wish I could remember them, who were just doing different stuff, like, guys who preceded Paris and, and out of Houston, had this crazy beat tape they made. When I found the Ghetto Vets record, that blew my mind, you know. Um, you know, so after I found that, I sort of followed Ramel Z's mm -hmm. trajectory, and I, you know, I found that record pretty much when it came out in the late 80s, mm -hmm. you know. You know, it's not also, also we're talking about the DC Go Go, Go Go music, Chuck Brown, Ryan Sons, all that. I got, so I got into Go Go because I was into funk, I because mean, my grandmother lived in DC, so we go down to DC, and there was a time where it was everywhere, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, to go to Dog Magazine, we do 10 pages of Go Go music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Trouble Funk and all that. Yeah, all them. <laughs> no. It's very underrated, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. passing style. Well, it's funny because you had guys like Chuck Brown who were really in between, you know, because like, he had been a funk band before there was even Go-Go, even though I think he like sort of invented Go-Go. But then mm -hmm. people really took it hard to like, you know, you had to have the paint cans for drums and shit like that. And that was the stuff I really liked. I mean, I love Chuck Brown too, but I was, in my mind, Chuck Brown was almost more of a funk artist and jazz mm -hmm. artist, even though he was the father of Go-Go. Yeah, your first album, Easy listening for Amagadon and the seven for me. It's a, it's a gem. If a bit of his time, it's a, a mix in the two, a trip hop, even psychedelic hip hop, and uh, it was a very early of his time for me. Uh, uh, I think about uh, Blade Runner, mm -hmm. about uh, Battle World, Geeks and Sissies, crazy tracks. It, uh, how it was your mind to to it? For me, it's a. Uh, it's a uh, it's an album classics like uh, I had uh, Mystic Stars of Trusty Mafia or, right. or, or, or or some album uh, who have uh, uh, heard this time back in the day. Yeah, can you tell us about about this album? Well, it was my first record, so yeah. you know your first record is always sort of what you've been thinking about all your life. That's why usually people's first and second records are their best records because they've been working on them their whole life. You mm -hmm. know. And welcome, um, easy listening for Armageddon, and welcome to the After Future was kind of like welcome to the After Future was actually the outtakes from from easy listening to Armageddon, but it was like you know it's kind of like I'd made a double album all my life, and there was some you know my primary interests were hallucinogenic drugs, mm -hmm. and, politi and politics, um, and. And sort of the deep out funk that corresponded with my hallucinogenic drug taking, you know. And I wanted mm. to make some sort of very black. Yes, and you like, produced like all the music. music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You rap and you produce all the music. It's yeah, crazy. I produced all the music. Yeah. What kind of equipment you you have back the day for produce this album? Uh, for both of them, I had an MPC 3000, mm -hmm. um, and I had a Casio FZ1 sampler. And I'd link up, I, I just rocked the two, and then I had some outboard gear, like a nice space, a space Echo, Mutron Biophase, and then since the first record I had a, a, thanks to a guy named Dennis Kelly, who was the engineer on the first record, um, I had an EMS, AKS synthesizer, mm -hmm. which is an old vintage synthesizer, that he gave me because he had three. I didn't give it to you, sold it to me for like 200 bucks. Um, and... Uh, he he really introduced me to analog synthesizers. Oh, okay. so that's on the first, <coughs> you know, from the first record on. It's always on my record. And uh, what kind of music you listened uh, with making this album? Or Around that time, it was a pretty time. wide variety of music. There are a couple of things that were really important. Um, 
kind of, God, I'm, I'm going to miss out what they were. I mean, there were some concrete things that I've been working with for a couple of years beforehand. Um, Divine Styler has been a huge influence on me. I would say Postanus' lyrics. Um, I was always a big fan of Jungle Brothers. Those were sort of like the main hip hop influences for that record. Um, and then uh, Sonny Chirac's record, Ask the Ages, had been a big influence. Um, some people I ended up sampling on that record, like Moondog. Uh, and then Bollywood music. Like, I lived in India yeah, but in high school. Yeah, the cover is crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was uh, the idea for the cover? Well, I, got, I, I went to high school in India for a year, 1986-87. And, you know, I was always just looking for the most out music I could find. And uh, being riding on a bus in India while well, you have Bollywood blaring through one mono broken speaker where, like, the mm. roof is cracked. It was like the mo one of the most punk rock experiences I ever had. And I was like, this shit is ridiculous. This is awesome. This had the screeching sound. It was like, ah, you know, yeah. and then the bass is sort of broke, coming through all cracked like that. So that was a big influence. Production-wise, I would say things like, um, what was I going for production-wise? Some weird mix between like Paul McCartney's Ram and Bad Brains just in terms of like this general sound I was looking for. Mm. Um, I remember being obsessed with how Paul McCartney mixed records, but I'd, I'd grown up so much with cassette tapes that I also just loved noise, you know? Yeah, oh yes. That's the background noise with cassette it's, tapes. Which Roman bass sometimes a mix with a, uh, like a trip pop, like a tricky or Ersling, remember yeah, Ersling, yeah. Radha, well, that was the a album Radha. Like, like, Tricky came out right when I was making that record, yeah. and I didn't want to be Tricky, you know. <laughs> um, but I was kind of like, oh man, he got to like some concepts that I was going for before I did, you know. Um, so like, and then what else came out around then? Beck also came out around then, which I wasn't, I wasn't definitely wasn't trying to be Beck, but but uh, you know he also was touching on some similar. Concepts. You know, everyone sort of comes up with the same ideas around the same time because mm. of whatever is floating around. At the same time, you had uh, also Keep Out the Funk of the sort of Underground. You, you know that type of, of yeah. sound of Mike. Well, was, uh, being in New York and yeah. being with Freddie, who was jazz, deeply the from the... And, uh, well, the thing that saved both records, saved my early records, and that I miss about living there, was Freddie, really, from Fred once from TME, and then, like, he's just sort of... So I'd have these really sort of psychedelic out ideas, but then I'd always ground them with my friends from the Bronx, who were, like, real purists, yeah. who tolerated me just because we were friends. But they sort of always brought it in a little bit, and like, nah, nah, man, you know, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yes, you got to have some sort of rules and regulations. And so they always sort of grounded those records. So, you know, and for me, it's always had to have a nice backbeat. And my, my thing is, is I always loved the lo-fi. Yeah, I think the at the time, so it's sometimes atmospheric. Yeah. It's reminds me sometimes, you, you talk about the noise of the tapes of the early uh, Memphis sound, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. a DJ sound or three six old school shit. Well, that was uh, another well, thing. DJ Screw, I think, uh, you know, well, DJ, DJ Screw was a, you too. DJ Screw was a huge influence. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> you listen to him back the day, at this time? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've actually been like sort of doing a return to DJ Screw. Yeah. Mm. Um, because he, he's like the father of everything that's happening. I mean, the last 10 years, DJ Screw is responsible for it. In terms yeah. of hip hop, in my opinion. Very underrated. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. producer. Uh, he, but you heard that Solange, someone chopped and screwed this, the last Solange record? Yeah, I heard about it. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> it's the best way to hear that record. But, um, <coughs> yeah, DJ Screw, and then also, you know, oh, the other thing that was a the biggest influence that I was trying and miserably failed at was to try and do a, a Charles Stepney type production. Mm -hmm. you know, Charles Stepney was a producer for a whole lot of records on chess. He did, you know, he's the, the mastermind behind the Rotary Connection, behind Mini Ripperton's first records. He did some of, he did, in my opinion, the Dell's best records. He mm -hmm. produced a bunch of Ramsey Lewis. And he always just worked with a lot of reverb and just sick drummers that no matter how much reverb put out, you know, you get it in the pocket. Mm. Anyway. 
And did you understand at this time, uh, Hisham or Nadas, you know, Detroit, Detroit Acid Rap, which was a mix uh, with a... Uh, I missed it. I didn't really catch that until later. Oh, yeah. I kind of, at the time, I'd missed it. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know that was happening. Mm. I heard about it later, obviously, and I was like, damn. I wish I'd known about it then. Yeah, and sometimes your music, I think about Banner Herman also, mm -hmm. like a Taxi Divers or Zotem, and also about repetitive music. I don't know if you listen to uh, Lamont Young, you know, all, all, all that, uh, Steve Reich and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kevin Barrias, all, all the style. Steve work. Reich, I listen to pretty heavy, you know, humans and, and Stockhausen as well. I remember being obsessed with uh, the Helicopter Suite. And you know, there was always I had a modern music influence too, just from the radio and what, what my mom would. You know, my mom sort of listened to this crazy mix of reggae, modern music, classical music, um, out jazz, and then R. You know, R and B, but like very specific people like Roberta Flack, George McRae, a lot of Nina Simone torn it on. I mean, the the principal records that t turned to my house growing up was. Bob Molly Live, anything by Jimmy Cliff, don't ask me why. This is all my mom's playlist. Uh, classical music every morning, uh, Keith Jarrett's Cone concert, um, George McRae, Rock Your Baby, anything by Nina Simone, and anything by Roberta Flack. And that's especially feeling like making love in first take. Like, that's, that's what my mom played, mm -hmm. was that, that mix of people. And... That had a big influence on me, and then, of course, she had this huge record collection, and I would just, I, I then made my own playlist out of that as I got older. Uh, I just want to talk about repetitive music because they, they created sample before the hip hop, right? Like the 60s, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about your album, Welcome to the After Future in 2000, and the, the track with the company Flow, Blood Runners? <coughs> by the day. Well, I'm um, that track came about just because me and well, me and LP had the same manager, and so we ended up being friends. And the manager is Amici Zungwe, who's still L's manager, and he now manages Run the Jewels. And um, me and L really got along. I ended up living at his apartment for a while in Brooklyn, uh, and he had heard we were both big Philip K. Dick fans. And he ended up claiming that even more than I did. <laughs> like, we met, and then he was like, all right, I'm going to be the Philip K. Dick fan. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we, we bonded on that, and bonded on uh, on our love for the film Blade Runner. So, so much so that we did, like, a, you know, a remake of the version that was on the first record, but with him and Big Just. Mm -hmm. You did also with the Majesticons, back the day, two, two, two things, uh... Uh, can you tell us about these projects too? On the, on the, on the Majesticons? Yeah, well, the, the, the Infesticons and Majesticons came about because um, Ninja Tune called me up, or Big Dada. Mm -hmm. Will Ashen, who was the head of it, because um, they had already been talking to Amici. They'd done something with Saul Williams and they wanted to do more more stuff with another artist that Amici was Mr. Lean, do. or um, uh, you got. Uh, yeah, well, Mr. Pop Consortium. Right. Pop. That, well, that all came after. Okay. So, I mean, it went in the order of, um, I think Will was trying to reach out to Saul, got to me, and then I made those records, and then that led to Antipop being there, mm -hmm. and Mr. So, Blank. Williams, too. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but well, Saul was the, f I think Saul was the first. Like, Will got in touch with Saul because he wanted to do something with Crust or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then... And then he heard me and he wanted to do something, so we ended up doing a whole record together and we really got along. I'm still friends with, the, with Will. Um, and then it grew from there. Then they did Anti-Pop. There was just a real alliance for a minute between Will Ashen and Amici Azungwe. Um But I, was, I wanted to do a side project because I was obsessed with how George Clinton could do Funkadelic and Parliament. Mm -hmm. And it almost, to me it almost felt like two totally different genres and... And um, so I wanted to do something like that, and something that didn't have to do with my persona entirely, um, which I love those records, and I, I love 
I love all my early shit. It's just weird because it then all of a sudden got me on this very obscure trajectory. Mm-hmm. Like I was already making obscure music, <laughs> and then to make obscure music, but then to uh, to further obscure myself with different labels, <laughs> it's like just strategically, mm-hmm. n'importe quoi, you know, like <laughs> strategically whatever. Um. I think about uh, the album uh, Nostalgia Tour, I, I have one track for me, it's crazy, it's uh, how electricity really works and uh, for me the, the, the production and uh, how you, what you say into it is, is, is crazy. So can you tell us about, about this track and uh, how it was your mind for the production and all that? Well, I wrote the poem years before. It's so deep, so deep. Thank you. It's a, it's a poem. I was doing a whole series of poems where it was sort of conversations with... I mean, I wrote the poem in like 93, because between 93 and 94 I did this series of poems about... where I'd sort of take an Orisha god, a goddess, and put them in conversation with one of the American founding fathers, mm-hmm. and was trying to make you know, sort of more genuine American history, which meant a more, much more... or mythology which meant an, Amer- an Africanized American mythology. Um, so I'd done this series of poems, and I, well, that one I liked in particular and kind of helped me get into graduate school. And then, so I used it, we made the music for it when we did Nostalgia Later. And Nostalgia Later is, uh, I'm trying to remember how it goes with it, like what was on it, because there was a lot of instrumentation. At the time I'd been touring with Jalil Bunton, who ended up being the drummer for um, TV on the radio, and this cat Damali Young, who lives in Sweden now, and that was the band. And so there was already there was it was the first time I really started exchanging ideas intensely with other artists in terms of what a record would sound like. Um, and I can't remember I'm trying to remember I can't remember exactly how that came about. Um, I was still working on the MPC 3000, uh, and then there was, I think there was a lot more EMS synthy mm. playing that, in that song. It was very hypnotic, very oniric, you know, <laughs> yeah. style. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about the, <coughs> the, the Father, Father Divine? Divine? Father Divine record? Father Divine, yeah. Oh, that record was commissioned by Thirsty Ear, and uh, there's me and this cat Guillermo Brown, who's an amazing drummer. And he was already, I'd known Guillermo for years. He'd actually been my drummer for a minute before the Mali. And um, he's just a great guy. And uh, he was working with the guys at Thirsty Ear on something else. And he heard I was doing a record. He's like, oh, I want to be on a... So he and I started working together. And he really helped propel a lot of the ideas. Um, and there's actually a whole section of that record that got cut because of... The guy who runs Thirsty Ear wanted more of what I was doing, but but Guillermo had this amazing work behind it. Um, Guillermo's now like um, he, he's a drummer with uh, Jerry Watts. Mm-hmm. Played on Jerry Watts's band, um, and you know he's got his own band called Pegasus Warning, and he was also in the band that I rap in now called Thieves. Uh, but anyway, so so I was just I was already living in France. It was the first record I made in Paris. Okay. It was sort of back and forth. I've never made a record just in Paris. I make part of it in New York. But I would go to Brooklyn, stay with him. We'd sort of come up with ideas, and then eventually, what I did is I ended up putting everything back into the MP. I'd recorded. I'd done two recording sessions, two days with Andrew Lamb, Vijay Iyer. Uh, yeah. You know, you did hold it down with him. With yeah, uh, yeah, we'd are do project to yeah, song. yeah, and we we done uh, and we done um, uh, uh, um, what do we do? The, the first one was the first collaboration with me and Vijay was in what language? Then we did Still Life with Commentator, and then we did Holding It Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got also with uh, Zone Libre. Yeah. Uh, some years ago, uh, how it was the experience to to make songs with them? Well, working with I love Sergio. Sergio is one of my favorite people to hang out with in Paris. 
and he's just got he's very clear as to what he wants and what he feels will work and so it was cool to work with someone like that um, and, and I learned a lot from him just in terms of someone who's you know reached a certain level in a certain country and then and learn how to just master his lifestyle around that too like, like Sergio's learned how to really enjoy himself and enjoy his music all at once and to continue to, to push boundaries in ways that excites him uh, and he's sort of got the funds to make that happen you know mm-hmm. but you know he's not rich he's just sort of well, maybe he is but I don't know you wouldn't be able to tell but he's but he's comfortable enough to just continue to experiment the way he wants and mm-hmm. it's not, he doesn't throw away the privilege that he got with 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 um, uh, La Noire Désir, you know? <laughs> I would say that that's what I really like about it. Like, he, he hasn't wasted that privilege. Yeah. He's, he's, he's taken it preciously and, and used it to, to kind of push things in interesting ways. And then, of course, Cyril Bibo and Marc Namor, awesome guys to work with. I mean, going on tour with them was always great. Mm. You got to also uh, game with Jeff Bucker. Yep. this one. Yeah. That record was crazy. Yeah. Just because I was supposed to, I really liked that record. And it didn't really do... It didn't make the type of noise that I was hoping it would make. Partly that's because Rogart isn't really interested in promoting a record at all. They just like to put it out. You know. And I knew that, that, I knew that going into it. Um, but the way we did that was... I was... I was actually trying to write, I, was, I had like five days to sort of organize and write some stuff for it, but my dad got sick, and I got a call, I was in a movie theater, and I get this call, it's like, I was in America, and I get this call from my sister, it says, yo, dad's in the hospital, in Rome, and I was like, holy shit, like, and he's gonna die, that was the issue. And so I had to pull like this middle class James Bond maneuver and buy a ticket to Rome that night to like, you know, I got off the phone and less than 12 hours later I was in Rome at the hospital. So, and then I had to take care of my mom and all this other stuff. And so by the time it was, I had come back to make the record, I had no prep time. So all I did was, it was me, Tyshawn, High Priest, and Jeff Parker. Tyshawn, sorry, he's like... Mm-hmm. A genius. <laughs> and so I just showed him a little clip from Pootie Tang, where Pootie Tang is making a, making a track, and he just turns off everything. <laughs> you know, because I was making, you know, talk, explaining how we, I wanted to make, you know, be as minimal as possible during the improvisation. And so then we did three, three recordings each 50 minutes of just improvisation. And I didn't know what we had when we finished. I was like, oh shit. And then I just cut like the best of those 50 minutes. I didn't edit it in any other way except just make it fade in and fade out. And I did that with Scotty Hart. And that's how the record came out. I like it because it's a, it's a 100% improvised. Okay. Um, can I tell us about your, your project with uh, Arad Kilo and uh, Vision of Seta? I met them because uh, the bassist Samuel called me up to do a guest on their previous record. And uh, yeah, I do a lot of guesting to feed my family. If somebody calls me and, and the music isn't atrocious, I'll say yes, you know. There's been a, I've done a lot of guessing where I don't necessarily love the music, but I need the fucking money. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, it's like I don't I don't make music for Coca-Cola. <laughs> I don't make music for Lockheed Martin. Uh, so that means I will take a lot of guest jobs where I don't necessarily I agree with the you know I don't 100 percent agree with the music. I always agree with it to at least 75 to 80 percent, or else mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do it. But um. But there, I, I really liked the music, and Mamani Keita had already put, laid down her part, and so it just flowed real quick, and it was just nice and easy. I was in and out of, in and out of that studio within 30 minutes, mm-hmm. and I like working like that. And and uh, Samuel paid on time, 
So that relationship started off very well, and then it turned into what we got now, which is, you know, a collaboration that seems to be working pretty well in France. Yeah. You got tracks like uh, Don Kula or Seeds. Seeds are very hip-hop <laughs> on this one. the only thing uh, yeah. track in hip-hop uh, music. Really. Can you tell us about this one, Seeds? Oh, it's just about, you know, how the how drug money, you know, sort of keeps world economies going. That's facts that everybody knows now, you know, that, that uh, I thought it was my own theory when I wrote the song, but then, you know, of course, yeah. everyone else agrees with it that, you know, the whole reason why the 2008 crisis wasn't even worse is because the amount of drug money floating around. Mm. You know, and then the fact that the CIA has been using drug money for, or using drugs forever for, mm. one, to keep the economy, well, one, to keep people oppressed, and two, to keep keep the economy going. So that's what that's about. Because the Nafcot also, just instrumental music, Nafcot. Yeah. Yeah. Dope too. Uh, also, some flute. Yeah. Can I tell about this one? Some flute. That was a freestyle I did yeah. at a radio show. Yeah. Okay. This is all, all the spoken word in there is freestyle. I don't write down spoken word. I'll write poetry down and I work on that's meant for the page. Uh, I'll write hip hop down, which for me is poetry in a certain type of form. But when it comes to spoken word, the type of shit that people snap their fingers about, I make that shit up on the spot. I don't have time to write that shit down. And uh, if you have uh, uh, three best album in hip hop, you like it? For me? Yeah. My personal three? Mm -hmm. Hold on. Um, I mean, I gotta probably get my car. Uh, my personal, damn. The easy, quick answer, well, one, uh, paid in full mm -hmm. is definitely in there. Um, as in terms of complete albums, hold on. So yeah, what I say, paid in full, I don't know, people are going to hate me for saying it, but I say done by the forces of nature. I love that record. Um, that influenced me a lot. For me, too, just the song, not the whole record necessarily, but, you know, and I've said this a thousand times, but um, Divine Style is Tongue in a Labyrinth, which is just a bass line and a fucking helicopter. That song blows my mind. I always love that song. And three five rappers? My favorite rappers? Yeah. See, I got funny ones. I like MCs that, that rap like they talk. So, for example, I put it in two categories, right? So, you know, I put, for me, I put Rakim Nas and maybe Divine Styler in one category. For me, that's my own thing. You know, I'm not getting in anybody's rap academy discussion. And then other M's, and then I put Ghostface, Redman, and the Vast Air in another category. I love those guys. And because Vast, he, he raps exactly like he talks. <laughs> And so, and so does Red Man and, and, and then Ghostface. Okay. Okay. Uh, very thanks for the interview, Mike Lad. It was a pleasure to have you. Yes, yeah, it's the all, all, anytime, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> all right. On tarmac treadways to bottomless pits, a tongue of dolphin bobbing in and out, a energy a babalu I ain't, bump ground and fire, I feel bone and jug jug flesh. I smell a ghost in here, smell a dog in here, smell some oil and sweat. I smell lust in here, I smell a ghost in here, I smell a dog in here, I smell oil and sweat. I smell lust in here. Dance me to chicken feathers, moisture makes it bad. Bones mustache, you can laugh, I know it tickles. Street lights make a carousel around me and she goes deeper. There is the needing of spine muscles, a pipeline hustle to the better half of a bit of brain. Breath falls on loop of neck, he rushes like liquor loaded Mardi Gras holidays. She begins to sway, the street turns to jelly. Smell the ghost.
said the forehead, giving lips distance for three seconds. So we suck in jungle gyms and alphabet lessons. She breathes, I can't speak. We keep groping, hoping stenching streets will disappear. But if she can't hear, then we can't smell neither. And so goes the fever on its course. Like freight trains and rolling boulders, rocket ships and cream lifts, marching soldiers into tunnels. And a million other images, like geysers and funnels. We keep rolling just the way my smell is going. Much more human being than I could wish for. Finger rumbles make hips genuflect. Caresses come correct, and suddenly we reflect. Our last time, despite the mind, then you go for yours, and I for mine. We walk alone on tarmac treadways to a simple home. I've got yellow brick road syndrome. I'm solo on my sojourn, but mouth, tongue, and lips still wet. All inside me, there is no forget, regret, or upset. Just the sweat that we leave on this street, and something burns like fall. Smell it. How electricity really works. The buildings are made of lightning. Benjamin Franklin in eternal shock, kite with key in hand after all these years. He is the ghost atop these towers, jumping from peak to peak like Jack Frost or Sandman. Very light from the distance. Hagen and shell shocked up close. His skin sags like muddy bags of rocks hauled from a mine. His clothes tattered and singed. He glows from radiation. It has been so many years. Oblivious to praise in his honor, his chateau in history is vacant. Bored with paintings by Danes of make-believe Negroes at ambivalent feet. He discarded letters in chess for fire from clouds. Delving in the games of gods, basking in new decadence, beyond women in Paris and the death of Indians. Something supernatural. The harnessing of energy. Electricity man. Sky crack, circuit surfer, illuminating home by home at the speed. Philly, New York, beyond, bringing to life toys in boys' bedrooms. A tinker bell from hell, a rumple still skin with weaponry. 
His niggas still smoking In wasted glee he keeps us well lit Live with syphilis caught from power His eyes swirl like peppermints gone wrong This deist The frocker of Jesus Now frocked in Orisha robes A sucker for Ishu Ogla of Ogun Jockeying for position with these gods Stuck in second with Santa Claus Demigod limbo aspirations kept him alive all these years General Electric is a loan shark It's hounds and sunglasses waiting Pontiacs to catch Ben Jumping light to light In their line of fire Old Glow they call him Con Ed can't find him not even by satellite They take our money with the ambivalence of vacuums And we pay Hoping for a glimmer We drop checks in mail slots like teeth beneath pillows Dance a little, smile And praise the crackhead running our appliance Old glow got us humming Rubbing raw the carpet, clinging together Ravaged by static Searching for the kite Grabbing at the key
No one did it.